Is this webinar format? So there are the people there, but... Seems to be. Hello. Welcome to panel three of section 19 on mathematical sciences to address societal challenges and issues. I'm Mary Lou Zeman, and I'm delighted to be moderating the session for us. I'm a mathematics professor at Bowdoin College in Maine, and I believe strongly in the concept that whatever our passion and whatever our talent, we can use them to help the planet if we wish. And so I've done a lot of work facilitating mathematicians and computer scientists to um, work on climate and sustainability issues. And in our panel today, we have four different experts telling us about different ways that they use their talents to help the planet. So our, our recording is in three sessions. The first session is with Sally Cripps. She's a professor of mathematics and statistics at the University of Sydney, and she's a research director at CSIRO, which is Australia's national science agency. Um, our panelist, Edward Lungo, was unfortunately unable to join us. So Chris Jones, very, um, I'm very grateful that Chris Jones stepped in. Um, and Chris will talk to us about his work in climate applications. So Chris is a professor emeritus at North Carolina State University in the USA and is the director of the Mathematics and Climate Research Network. Our third session is a conversation with Cathy O'Neill and Sergio Fajardo. So Cathy is a mathematician and data scientist and author of the best-selling book Weapons of Math Destruction and has co-founded Orca, which is an algorithmic auditing company. And then Sergio Fajardo is a math professor and politician from Colombia, and for example, recently ran in the presidential election in Colombia. So you see that we have a variety of different ways that people are using their mathematical minds to help the planet. So Jasper, thank you, let's start. So for this part of our panel discussion, I'm delighted to welcome Sally Cripps, who's from Australia. She's a statistician and research director of analytics and decision sciences within the mathematical and computational sciences arm of Australia's National Science Agency, which is called CSIRO. And Sally, maybe you would take it from there. Thank you. I will. And thank you so much, uh, Mary Lou, for inviting me on. I'm really thrilled to be here today and to be able to talk about my work. Um, I'll just say for the record, prior to joining, I only joined CSIRO uh, less than a year ago. Prior to that, I've always, I was at a professor of statistics at the University of Sydney in Australia. So I've had an academic career, but CSIRO has given me the opportunity actually to take a lot of what I do um, as, a math, as a mathematical statistician and apply it to uh, a variety of areas. And so uh, when I was asked to speak about um, how to use mathematics in, in cases to address societal challenges, um, I was very keen to talk about the work that um, I have done in the past, but actually most particularly, I thought I'd talk about what we're doing, what my favourite project is at the moment. Um, and that favourite project is uh, work that I've been doing that's been funded jointly by CSIRO, but also by a philanthropic organisation called the Paul Ramsey Foundation. And they're very interested in understanding intergenerational social disadvantage and how we might use mathematics, um, and in particular Bayesian statistics, which is my speciality, to understand what are the, you know, to try and decelerate the on-ramps and accelerate the off-ramps of social disadvantage. Um, as you can imagine, um, when it comes to something like social disadvantage, there are so many factors that go into it. Um, there are there are factors to do with um, social background. There are you know certain ethnicities might be um, more subject to discrimination than others. Uh, there's differences in education. There's a whole plethora of um, factors that are possible, and there's a whole plethora of data out there. We've all heard of this word big data and it's been going around forever. But unfortunately, most of that data is perfectly useless when it comes to actually tr really trying to unravel what's going on. And so the work that we're doing for the Paul Ramsey Foundation and within CSIRO to understand this is to, we're, we're doing three very tr interesting but tricky um, 
mathematical statistics problems that I'll just recap briefly. So the, the first one is graph theory. So I know a lot of you do graph theory. Uh, you would have done it in your undergraduate degree. Um, and what we're using with graph theory is understanding certain conditional probabilities to untangle the interconnectedness of several factors. And although graph theory will never, despite what the machine learning community tell you, will never actually prove causality, it's certainly suggestive of it. And so we're coming up with ways of understanding <clears throat> conditional independencies to unravel, to trace back the causal structure or the causal pathway that led to a particular outcome. Now, the reason obviously that's of interest to the philanthropic organisation is because they want to know if they intervened or governments, if they intervene, you know, what intervention should they do? What does, what seems to be the actual pathway as opposed to just knowing that that education is correlated with social disadvantage, what parts of education, if they intervened at this person's age, would that have made a difference? And all of that is actually developing a whole lot of new theory and methodology around stuff called directed acyclical graphs. And I've got three PhDs, the math PhD students working on that problem at the moment, and it's very exciting. Um, secondly, because um, the other a way we're using mathematics in that is via directly via information theory, which is you know very related to probability theory. In fact, there's a very strong correspondence between the two. Why are we doing that? Well, it turns out that most of the data that governments collect, when it's, it's collected for other purposes, it's not really useful in determining the sort of research questions that we're asking. And so we're using probability theory or information theory to say how much information content, if I had this piece of data, how much would that reduce my uncertainty about? And so we're actually using that as a, as a guide, a sequential data acquisition and setting up real-time experiments. We're working with the Department of Education in the state of New South Wales. They're another part player in this and, uh, and they've generously made available their data. And they're actually going to um, put interventions in place in certain classrooms, see what the impact of that intervention is. They come back into our um, mathematical models that we uh, try to evaluate, you know, what the impact of that was. And if that is correct, where, where should the next targeted intervention be? And that targeted intervention be something that will maximise benefits to society, but at the same time minimise our uncertainty. So, and this is a technique called Bayesian optimization. Lastly, it's probably most complicated, the hardest part of it all is we're developing new algorithms in uh, what's called Markov chain Monte Carlo theory uh, to try and explore discrete spaces. The number of possible possible graphs, the graph space, the number of graphs you can have is a discrete random variable, but it, it grows very large very quickly. It's in fact grows super exponentially. So if you have only 10 factors, you know, you have about two to the 45 possible graphs, that's more ants than there are on the planet um, and that's only 10 factors so you can imagine when you've got hundreds of factors there's no computer on the planet that can do an exhaust an exhaustive search over all possible graphs so we've got to construct algorithms that hop around and hopefully we hit the most probable ones and that's a problem in discrete um, optimization a very very complicated problem again lots of phd students trying to work on that so so those are the sorts of challenges that we're actually trying to solve uh, right now at the moment um, with with governments and with um, with CSIRO um, embedded at the centre and philanthropic institutions. I That's didn't very, know whether you wanted to Yeah. Yeah. Carry on and I'll, I'll okay, ask so, questions. So yeah. one of the, so one of the, um, uh, we, you know, that's that's one area. That's the most current area that 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 I'm working on. It's probably the most challenging problem, but it, it came as a result of um, for a long while. I, I did mainly methodology um, research in the first part of my career, um, and you know, how did I sort of tumble into all of this? Was I was fortunate enough to get what's called a future fellowship in Australia, which is where I'm sure they have them in other parts of the world, where they give you a break from teaching and so you can do research. And, and I think that these are just so invaluable to young or mid-career researchers because what they enabled me to do was I was able to take a step back off the, the sometimes very conservative um, paper writing treadmill that we get into as academics. And 
um, being and, and so I was, you know, I thought, well, I've got five years, you know, I have to show something for it at the end of five years, but that's five years is a long time. And so I started to take risks about what I was doing. And so initially I got interested in, um, I worked in uh, trying to understand um, domestic violence. Um, uh, actually, I was interested in understanding Gaussian processes and they were very applicable in, in that particular case. Um, I got in and I, I had a great time. I, I worked with archaeologists um, around using, you know, where zinc deposits were found across Asia to try and understand the migration of humans across uh, Central Asia. Um, a lot of work with mental health experts um, uh, and obviously medical doctors, but a lot of physical scientists as, as well. And, and in all of that, it was a, a very much a a team effort, which I think is different for us mathematicians. I often sort of joked that when COVID hit, you know, you didn't have to tell the maths department where I worked to social distance. It's just what they did naturally. You know, everybody <laughs> yeah, went yes. and closed their doors. Uh, that right. was just a normal day. Um, so it was quite a different thing. And I was lucky that I had one or two excellent mentors who uh, actually said, you know, you've got this opportunity, step back. Uh, and, and showed me the way and were okay for the first two years. Because I've got to tell you, I stumbled a lot yeah. in those first yes. Two years. Yes. I made, I tried to do too many little things that didn't really add up. And then I sort of thought, I thought, well, I'm going to focus on one thing that I'm passionate about and it was social disadvantage and how can we do that? Right. Um, and I also yeah. made it align with some of the work that I was passionate about in mathematics, which at, at that time was, UMC, Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithms and graph theory. And so how I could see the potential of graphs to answer a number of questions. And so I married those two up. But it was a journey of five years really to actually get to the point where I am now, which is running a large research center with a team. With, I've got 240 researchers. It's very exciting. Yeah. Um, so but it was, I couldn't have done it not stepped off that treadmill yeah and it's very interesting that i think almost everybody on this panel has one way or another stepped off that treadmill and i i did the same thing myself when i decided to really think about biology and i spent two mm. years just immersing myself in biology literature and then i got a grant so that i could go work in a biology lab so absolutely stepping away from the math treadmill you're right yeah, it is. It, it, yes, it, it, and and because if you're really going to make an effort in that that particular domain, you really have to be. Or you also have to become a good listener. Yes, you have to listen to to the other domain. You yes. you really need to understand, and they need. You need to find a good partner in the in in the area that you're working into. Yes, um, they have to be also willing to come on the journey. Um, yes. and so I found. Yes. Uh, that's often more easy for senior people who've already made their career than it is for junior people. Yes. Uh, and so I do worry that we're not giving junior people enough scope to take more risks. Um, but, but that's, that's how, um, that's how I began. And I, as I said, I was lucky, but it, it wasn't, a, it, it's something that took several years to actually come to fruition. And you were able to do it as at a more junior level because you had this junior fellowship. Yes, I was able, well, it was sort of mid-career, I was able to step back. Right. Um, and without yeah. that, I think I still would have, you know, been yeah. sitting there yeah. uh, writing what yeah. I was quite enjoyable, but but was really yeah. low yeah. risk. And I do worry that, you know, with, uh, I, obviously publications are important, but when publications just become, you know, being able to tweak the last publication with another incremental piece, that may be valuable too in its own way, but we need to have a serious discussion about how we are going to measure impact other other ways. Other, I mean, publications is easy. You can count them, you can go onto an H index and you can do it, you know, you can have a look um, and that's all sort of every, you know, out there in the public, but actually, you know, to really value impact, you've got to read and actually assess what the individual has done, you know, and, and I think we need to spend more time in our institutions trying to understand the impact of somebody's work yes. um, in and order to encourage not, them. Yes, and, it, and they may not have their impact through a publication. It might be much more direct oh. working with educators, for example, as you've described. Yes, yes, setting up real-time um, 
you know, working with them to, you know, with Bayesian optimization to understand, you know, which interventions are going to work under what conditions and, right. Um, right. you know, doing all of that. And, and actually, one of the great things about CSIRO is that, um, you know, obviously, publications are very uh, one metric, but they're only regarded as one metric and impact is really um, highly regarded. And so I've was I've been very much encouraged to do more of what I had begun doing at universities, but doing it at CSIRO to, um, you know, to, to have that impact. And, and um, so that's been a wonderful opportunity for me. Yes, that's a very good idea. It's, um, I hear people often talk about how institutions need to change their reward structure to encourage more um, risky and impactful research. But the idea of just measuring the impact is a very straightforward yes. one. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so yeah. yeah. So just to actually and to, and to take the time. I mean, it's like reading people's papers. That takes time versus looking at number of citations. But yet, if you're really to assess the originality of somebody's work, you know, and put a bit of thought into it, then that's what we should do. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So these are the sorts of things that I've been thinking about in terms of, um, you know. Uh, practical things that we can do to help um, more people take take risks. And also, I'm just very passionate about, I mean, I've just talked about what maths can do in this social context. And um, I'm pleased to say that, you know, the the head of the philanthropic institution who awarded us the grant is now the, um, the chief civil servant, actually, in Australia. So okay. a very useful person to know. Yeah. And, <laughs> And he gave a press uh, interview where he said what he had learned about the methods um, that we were doing while he was head of that philanthropic organisation, he hopes very much to instil them uh, in government. And I think that would just be a wonderful um, legacy to leave to, to actually take this out of the realm of not just education or not just social disadvantage, but to use, you know, embed this sort of mathematics and, um, and to pursue the new mathematics that comes out of it. One of the things I've been passionate about doing is using the applications, not just to apply maths to, but actually they give you the best topics yes. to actually work on because you come to it like you, you want to understand the causal structure of social disadvantage and you think about directed acyclical graphs and you say, how can I possibly know which of two to the power of 200 graphs is the most optimal graph. And yeah. that starts to be a really hard discrete optimization problem. So you, you, you're pushing forward um, new mathematics or new mathematical methods in my area in Bayesian statistics at the same time as learning about social disadvantage. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, I find yeah. exactly, the same, exactly the same thing. I like working on resilience questions. My training is very uh, low dimensional dynamical systems. and. You just look, you take your old, your training, but you look through this new lens, you look at it through this new lens of the application, and it's amazing what new insights you get into the mathematics. Yes, I know, and I think that is being such a, a wonderful thing to actually realise how much that interchange between new methods in your own area inspired right. by applications and then you know and that in you know that to and in throwing i find is uh, is really yes, yes. i think uh, that and throwing is going back and forth on a bridge yeah it's very applied yes. and very theoretical end and like to sort of run back and forth along it a bit you do i actually gave a talk when i came to Syria and it was called um it was called uh uh you know from the general to the specific and yeah. back again, you know, a, a statistician's tale. And, um, and and it was that sort of journey about how you come up with, you know, you someone presents you with a problem and you, I tried to work on it from a specific point of view and then you do and then you back away from it and you say, well, what are the general principles there? And how can I generalise this? And that's what maths does, right? Maths is a generalisation. So how can I generalise it? And you generalise it and then you get to another applied problem where you realise that actually that generalization is not going to apply there. So you go back in and you'd be specific again and then right. pull back and generalize. And so I think that that's, I think it's, um, you know, we're blessed actually in that we, we study in a field that enables us to cross so many other fields. Yes, yes, exactly. And so then I wonder if, if you have time, do you have a, could you give any insight, especially for junior people who might be listening, um, as you're, as you're crossing into other fields, are there, 
people often get stuck at the point of, okay, I'm working with a social scientist. How do I bring their data into my mathematical structure? Somehow there's a place where decisions have to be made where there's the real meeting point of the disciplines. Do you have any insights I'm, about I'm, that? Jeff? Yes, I do. And I, I, I have actually, I, I, I call them pie people. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I call them translators. <laughs> and I call them pie people because they're like the Greek letter pie yeah. instead of, you know, the, uh, and they've got a oh. foot in each pie. Yes. And, um, <laughs> um, and actually, without them, you're lost. Mm -hmm. I, well, I was lost. And I finally got the university to um, acknowledge that if we were to do this cross disciplinary thing well, then uh, I think it's otherwise it's a bit so I'm a bit cautious of junior researchers they they I mean not cautious of them but I'm, I worry that they don't perhaps have quite the clout to get their university to front up with them yes to people but I, I do think institutions have to provide that support and these poly people they need to be able to make that translation from from, from you to the other person or provide that or at least provide the the mechanism by which their data can be transferred over. I mean, that would be the minimum. Mm -hmm. But but a good translator is somebody that may not come up with the new mathematics, but I can write them new. I can write the mathematics up on the board. They can a great translator would be somebody who can a program it up. <laughs> yes. Be um, uh, be talk the language of the other um, discipline and translate. You know to say you know so many times i've had um, when i've been working you know um i've got this wonderful guy called you know roman and, and roman say well so sally what they're saying and is is really this that that these interventions here happen on those schools because of this and that data lies in these structures and they can't get it out and so that's that type of person who makes that glue that pie person is right. essential um, and so since i've come to syro i'm you know in all the research groups what i'm doing is hiring people well, like that and i'm embedding them. Yeah. yeah embedding them. and i would hope that for junior researchers that that you work closely with your institutions to try and get those sorts of support that you need in order to um, make that translation happen because with all their other duties and they're coming up in their careers and they typically they sometimes have you know young families you know when you're starting out and you're you know it can just be overwhelming and it's yeah. it's too much and they're spread too thin and it's no it's not a good idea to be spread too thin when you're particularly when you when you're doing right. yeah and you can't so it can be fun to totally immerse in the other discipline but you can't you your career doesn't consist of immersing all in all the other disciplines no 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 you, you still have to push yes right. yes and and it's those connecting pieces that yeah. um make it put it's the glue that make yeah. it possible that makes yeah. it possible without that without that i found you know if the if if you have a center that's trying to do that sort of applied or translational research without those glue people it very soon bifurcates into yes. people going back writing their own sort of in, you know papers that they know how to do and the other group going off and doing something else and you lose that magic that happens when a whole you know, when different disciplines really meet and are really immersed yeah That's a, a wonderful so i would i would say that to the junior people is is lobby hard for and for the even more junior people it might be decide maybe you would like to be one of those glue people the it's yes absolutely really fun life to be that glue person yeah. but realize that people are really different. yeah and it's a skill to be able to do that yes. yeah to, to actually it's a real skill to be able to be that um that that pie person that is you have to be a very good listener you have to be very good at, at maths because you have to be able to operationalize the mathematics Right. Uh, and um, which is another thing entirely. So I've left out the importance of, in my world at least, of computational science, which is fundamentally. I mean, I've talked about I'm in the, come from the maths background, but I have very, very good computational scientists that I work with too. So without them, I, that's why I like the fact that they're we're all sort of together. Yes. In this, yeah. yeah. It sounds like a wonderful environment. It is. It is. Good. I feel like uh, I feel like I've been. I feel blessed. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I can see that. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. It is. 
Well, that's thank you. That was a lot of really useful and I think great information for junior scientists to hear to think about how they want to position themselves to yeah. work on socially important. Yeah, problems. and to and, and in general, I think to to understand the role of applications in generating new yeah. mathematical yeah. or statistical computational knowledge to yes. the interplay that applications have in generating new theory, I think yes. is also not to be underestimated yet. No, I agree with you and it is so exciting. It's, uh, it is exciting. It is when you think about all the great, I think about all the great sort of things that were done in the last 300 years, lots of them were done in response to trying to actually solve a problem. Right, that's right. Yeah, it's not to say that there's not a place for just sitting around and thinking wonderful blue sky thoughts and putting that down on paper that has a role as well but that's right but there is also a role of the the application generating um yes, yes. Thought in that's right and there really is a meeting of them right? there is yeah right. i think i think there's a great meeting and i think there's a lot of excitement and a lot of motivation yeah right happens, yeah well thank you sally well thank you uh, it's been a real pleasure to yeah, speak I to agree. you Okay, well, for this part of our panel discussion, I'm really happy to welcome Chris Jones. Chris is from the US and um, is a mathematician and director of the Math Climate Research Network. So welcome, Chris. And hey. perhaps you would like to start with giving us a brief introduction to yourself for this ICM context. Uh, let's see, I, I'm a mathematician. I see myself now as an applied mathematician. I'm not sure I have throughout my whole career, but um, I certainly have done in recent years, but I'm somebody who kind of crosses over between pure and applied math and that I really do get my kicks from doing uh, mathematics within the context of applications. Uh, I, yeah, I, I, although I'm originally from the UK, most of my career, my PhD in career is pretty much entirely been in the US with the exception of four years at the University of Warwick. I've been at places all across the US uh, Arizona, Maryland. I was at Brown for a number of years in applied math and most recently the University of North Carolina. So I, I, I don't know, do you do anything more than that simple biography? That sounds, that sounds great it's and thank a, you for making more precise my <laughs> from the US. <laughs> so yeah, that's, um, I really like the way that you describe crossing between pure and applied math. So could you maybe describe an example of a way you use math to address some kind of societal challenge? Okay, um, let me give a couple of examples because I, I, I kind of feel like applied mathematicians need to work a bit on two levels. Uh, one level is where you are actually communicating with domain scientists. Um, so let me talk about that first. Um, so I'm currently at a, I, I'm in Grenoble in France right now at a, a conference on sea ice, um, which is something that I got interested in, I don't know, about 2013, 2014, when uh, somebody I knew was getting to know fairly well through uh, data assimilation, which was an area I was working in at the time, moved to Norway uh, to the Bergen Center uh, the Nan sorry in Bergen to the Nansen Center of Environmental and Remote Sensing or something and anyway there was a group working on sea ice that's of obvious interest in Norway is what's happening to the ice in the Arctic um, and we started talking with them about data assimilation so fast forward about seven years there is now a massive project headed up by somebody who moved from uh, Bergen to Grenoble uh, who's actually French uh, to build a next generation sea ice model that will be compatible with the next generation climate models, uh, all full climate models, because sea ice has largely been dealt with as a sort of separate entity and something of, a, of an anomaly and a, a, a difficult object to integrate into a full climate model. So that's their mission. And that is going to be done over the next six years. So why is a mathematician interested in that? Well, I'm interested in it because um, the the modeling brings up the modeling and the uh, the issues in constructing the models and incorporating data brings up 
deep and fascinating mathematical questions. I would not say that these questions are those that are of direct and immediate interest to the domain scientists because they're sort of rather product oriented and you know they want to produce something that they can give to the funder uh, which is a foundation in the US actually um, and uh, coordinate with people who are doing other parts of this next generation climate model. Nevertheless, there are many, many issues that, that come up which are inherently in, uh, mathematical and, as I say, can be very, very interesting from our point of view. So my role there, uh, albeit seemingly fairly small, is to try to tease those, those, those mathematical issues out of uh, the entire, the, the, this whole project that that is very product oriented so so i go to these meetings i'm actually working with a number of people there and i see where we can contribute through the injection of by we i mean applied mathematicians that i'm representing in a way by the injection of sort of mathematical ideas um, they may not be interested in actually talking about the the mathematics that i see spinning off of that but but they are uh, really interested in in the ideas and how they might influence the further development of the project so yes. that's kind of the first thing sorry you gotta... no, no i was just saying that it sounds really interesting and i recognize exactly what you're talking about yeah yeah this hmm. so so that so you you really do wear kind of two to your two two sets of clothes here. One is to go talk to the domain scientists and then the other is to take these problems off sort of on your own and, and figure out, um, you know, what are interesting mathematical issues that we can work on with the hope that there is a, a feedback loop or with the prospect and, and the understanding that there will be a feedback loop but not immediately that is say on a decade for instance time scale maybe even longer where you are developing ideas and methodologies that because of their being motivated by the application will come back and have impact on that application but but you but the the odd thing is that you can't really get the immediate interest of the domain scientists in these things because they are too far down the road yes. so another example of a thing i've been working on and this is uh, i was working on last week when i was working with a colleague in ireland uh, is something like that which is actually it's not related to sea ice it's related to ecology and something that Mary Lou would probably be quite interested in it. It's, it's uh, mm -hmm. about a moving habitat. Uh, and where as climate uh, change happens, uh, habitats of certain species are inevitably going to move. I mean, think of them actually moving up a mountain to find uh, a, a climate that matched what the climate was that the species was living in or moving okay. further north. Right? So these will happen on slow time scales, but there's the possibility that that could happen too fast, that the habitat could move too quickly, that the species won't be able to adapt. That's an example of rate induced tipping, which is something I've been involved in understanding mathematically. And we have, uh, my colleague and uh, Sebastian Vucharic in Cork and I have, have uh, well, he, he's really done this first with, with his postdoc, Chris Hassan, have, but together we've now kind of isolated a, a, a mathematical problem that is very clear, involves dynamical systems, partial differential equations, and is quite, looks quite challenging and quite interesting to understand, you know, to try to sort of decipher when this, whether this will happen, when it might happen, and as the ecology gets more complicated, how that might interact with the moving habitat. So this is just really, really nice mathematics from many different points of view. And ecologists are pretty mathematical, but I think it will take a little while before we can actually tell them the story. So, but a story is emerging. Yeah, that does sound very interesting. And there are, I also talked to ecologists who are looking at rate tipping ideas. It's a good application for it. 
Yes. Yeah, I think that's yeah. right. Yeah, that's actually an example of something that has developed within the mathematical sphere yes. and people then wake up and hear about it when it's kind of formulated and matured and evolved into something that can be explained more broadly. Uh, 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 other areas like ecology will pick up on it. Right, right. Yes, that makes sense. So um, just building on that a bit, it's, you've talked about wearing these two different hats. Um, can you give us some insight into how you find, how you do that teasing apart, how you find questions that may be amenable to a mathematical approach when you're wearing your um, talk to the domain scientist hat? Well, I listen, right? That's, uh -huh. that's the key thing is you listen to what they're saying and you uh, internally translate into your own language as best you can. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it takes some, it takes a little courage because it, it can be kind of discouraging listening to things that you don't understand right. uh, and you are not expert in. Um, and and so, so you have to do that. That's a key part of it and you have to enjoy doing it. Um, but then you've got to, I think, understand the, the, the thinking about the mathematical problems that are going to come out of it. As I, I sort of touched on this a little bit already, but, but I think this is so important is that you've got to give yourself the space to think about those things uh, without feeling like you have to uh, justify them to the domain scientist you know, from whom you got the, 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 the problem or whatever, you know, from whose work you, you tease this problem. You've got to give yourself that freedom to formulate that mathematical problem uh, and not be discouraged by the fact that they, you know, probably won't, uh, they probably wouldn't they'd think, uh -huh, yeah, well, okay. If you want to think about that, that's that, okay. Yes. But yes. It's not of that much interest to me. Yes. And you saying, well, it will be in 10 years. It's not, <laughs> really doesn't, going to, doesn't help. Right. Right. Yes. I, so found, got... uh, I found that, um, for example, when I'm talking to biologists, it's very interesting. And I, I think as mathematicians, we're lucky that everybody respects that mathematicians are intelligent. So even when we're asking questions that show crystal clearly, we don't understand this particular thing uh -huh. we're discussing, we're okay. still treated with intellectual respect. Mm -hmm. I think it's a luxury of our discipline. But then I feel I have to go and put myself in a different physical space to allow myself to be a mathematician again and right. do what right. you're saying. Yes. Right. Exactly. Yeah. It, is, it takes time. It's a very deep skill that we don't train people well. No, it's the problem. We don't train people at all in this, right? And it's something right. that it's taken you and I probably a yes. half a life. <laughs> to, to realize <laughs> yes. and, and try and help with yes so then um another yeah, that's a very good question sorry is how how whether that is a skill you can teach and how do yeah. you teach that skill that right. seems to me to be one of the really critical issues facing the discipline of mathematics right now yes and i think in general um we keep saying that the societal problems we're facing will need more interdisciplinary approaches and that mm -hmm. somehow we we educators need to train students to be comfortable living a more interdisciplinary life than we live mm -hmm. and so how do we train people to be more interdisciplinary than us um so do you have to, i know you've done a bunch of this so do you want to give some inspiration about how you've done it how you might advise other educators. You mean how I've done the training or? Yes, how you train, how you think you might have been successful in training people to to look for the mathematics and the application in the domain science. Yeah, that's a very good question. I mean, I, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know that I have done it consciously. That's a very good question. Um, well, so I've watched you do it. Um, I've watched you bring junior mathematicians and scientists together. I've watched you give the junior mathematicians a lot of leeway in struggling to put together a model and then giving and then 
um, intervening to help them, but not but not doing it for them, giving them the first try, just like we would if we want them to learn how to prove something. We'd let them struggle right. with the proof right. if we really want them to learn. Right. We let them right. struggle with the proof so that they right. listen with intelligence right. when we show them. And so that same, giving that same um, that same pedagogical power to, have, to, to the question of how you pick out an, an applied question, I think is something most of us don't try. But one thing that I, I think as you speak, I just sort of realized, and I'm gonna throw this out there, I'm not mm -hmm. quite sure if this is correct or not, but, but it, it may be easier to transfer your mathematical interest or real um, satisfy your mathematical interest in a number of different areas but it may be harder to satisfy your applied interest in different areas and maybe that's more particular to the person mm -hmm. uh, i mean you definitely have types of mathematical skill there's no question and you have to find your own but you know, some some students would be really interested in climate, and so that some others may be drawn to health, and yes. maybe the the source of uh, their interest in a particular area is it comes from a different place. That it's more to do with them, their uh, you know personal lives, backgrounds, upbringing, environment they've grown up in, country they're from, or whatever. So an example of that is I have a, a current student who is uh, interested in wildfires, which is something that I was not interested in at all a year mm -hmm. ago or a year and a half ago before she approached me. And she ended up working with me because I was the only person in the department <laughs> who was actually willing to work with her on an area that the application of which the, the application area I knew nothing about. Right. Everybody else said, yeah, you can come work with me, but you have to work on the application that I am working on and, and yes. then it'll work well. You can't really bring your own application. Um, but I think this may be sort of uh, important because it, to, to, to really get the enthusiasm for a particular area is very sort of personal. I mean, she really, really wants to work on wildfires. It was absolutely clear. And even when we started tangentially talking about other things and, uh, you know, related things in ecology, it was very clear she just did not have the level of enthusiasm for it. So we've, we started to carve out some work and she's now spending the summer at Los Alamos talking with people who are developing wildfire models. And, um, so you've got to have that kind of leeway. I don't know. I mean, I'm a stage in my career where I have that luxury. I don't have to have students necessarily promoting my particular area. So, yes, you know, everybody who's been on this panel has talked about in some way or other, making a conscious decision to to not to either not just continue on the math treadmill or they got a grant that allowed them not to have to focus so tightly on pursuing their career so everybody's talked about how you have to make space in your life somehow in your academic life mm -hmm. to do this mm -hmm. just as you're mm -hmm. describing you have the luxury to do now right. um it's an interesting point and um, so actually you've Another question I had is quite like, it's quite related to this is um, in while you're doing this applied work, I'm asking what other disciplines are used together with the math sciences. So you're talking about lots of domain sciences. But the question is, can you give us insight into how you find effective points of contact between the disciplines? Well, it has to be the problem, right? So it has to be the the overarching issue. So, and, and for me, uh, climate has become that um, because that is such a pressing societal issue. And, you know, certainly the people in our science world realize that, they acknowledge it, and they know it's something that, you know, we are compelled 
to work on through our understanding of what it's going to take to make the world a, a, a livable place over the next century and beyond. Um, and uh, I, I, I think that's what will, that's the kind of thing that will bring people together. I mean, I can see it can be other things that, that could bring people together. But once you acknowledge that, say in regard to climate and you realize, say for instance, for like the sea ice thing, that you realize that you've got to understand the way sea ice works and you've got to understand how it's going to be, <laughs> how it's going to be integrated into a larger understanding of, of the way climate works. And if part of that understanding is building a mathematical model, which is basically a, a replica of the, the Earth system, including that, you then start drilling down and you start seeing all the different areas that are going to need to come together. So you've got to have physicists who, who uh, understand the way ice works. Then you've got to have kind of engineers who, who, who are willing to, to look at it at at macro scale and model it. You then mm -hmm. got to have uh, numerical computational scientists who are willing to, to build the, the model out of it. Uh, and then you've got to have people who understand the rest of the climate who will integrate it right. and so on. And that's, and then, and then going knocking on from there, you would have, uh, you know, ecologists who understand the way that the, the, fish populations or whatever are getting and other species in the water and in, on the ice are getting impacted and, and so on. I mean, it's just, it knocks on to just almost every area. And then the, um, obviously the, the sociology and the politics of, uh, you know, how the human population is, is going to adapt to, to new realities or face the, the facts that, uh, of uh, what we're going to have to do to change things, right. to change the CO2 output, basically. Right, right. You're, the way you're describing all these pieces needing to come together reminds me of um, Tom Eisner, um, a wonderful um, insect scientist, who described himself as a stitch in the fabric. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, we really right. need to be a, a well a right. well held together fabric here. Um, right. Yes. Um, so coming back to you a little bit, so now I'm thinking as we wrap up about how how we might help junior scientists who might be inspired to pursue some of the things you've just described as us needing. Um, I'm wondering two things, if you could give um, a bit of insight into something that helped you move in this direction in your own career and then maybe give some advice to how junior scientists or mathematicians might shepherd their own education and training towards becoming part of this fabric of helping decide how we're going to address climate issues. So what helped me come in this direction? Well, it was sort of uh, some internal and external pressures, I guess, made me more applied. Uh, the desire to have do something meaningful in the world. Um, but also the pressures when I moved to an applied math department at Brown, the pressures of uh, bringing in more funding and stuff like that. <laughs> um, well, I mean, one specific event though, that, that, that you know about, because it was you who, uh, who, told, who, who uh, stood up at a meeting in Berkeley in 2007 at MSRI and said, hey, this is something we should all be thinking about. This is a big issue for us, is climate. And that was a, a sort of turning point moment for me. So I don't know, these are, just, these are just funny little things that happen along the way. If you're a student and you consciously want to do this, then I would think the main piece of advice is find somebody who will mentor you, who will respect both sides of this equation, right? The mathematical side and the going out and talking to domain scientists and working with them and understanding their issues. So another piece of that actually working with domain scientists is that, is that you do 
you, you can't just listen to them and walk off and do math problems. You do actually have to do stuff with them and work with them. And that may be stuff that, that will happen that will, you know, produce something immediately. So, so you have to actually work on two different levels, not think on two different levels, actually do work that, that has some kind of immediate impact and be able to take these things off on your own. So, you, so you've got to have, find a mentor who, who is willing and able to uh, lead you into, into, you know, both spheres and with, with equal respect of both. I mean, and maybe so what, um, one, I'm just thinking, what did we do with the Math Climate Research Network is we helped students create mentoring teams. teams it doesn't have yeah, to be a single right. person. It doesn't have to be a single person, but but the people have to respect yes. the mentoring team. I mean, one tendency that has worried me a little bit in mathematics over you know, recent years is that, is that there, there is an acknowledgement that career paths now are not primarily academic. A large, I think, a majority of PhD students go on to non-academic careers, and this is dealt with by uh, by uh, sending students off to do summer research projects at labs or in industry or whatever, this is a great thing. But what worries me is that they come back to the math department, they see their advisor and their advisor gives them five minutes to tell them what they did over the summer. And they said, and then the advisor might say, okay, that's very nice. That's very good. I'm glad you had that experience. Now let's stop talking about it and let's go back and just talk about the mathematics, which has nothing to do with that. Right. I think that's a, that's that's a problem that faculty and math departments are going to have to address. That they are going to have to get interested in this stuff themselves. Yes. Well, thank you, Chris. That was very welcome. A thank lot you. Of really insightful points. Very helpful. Okay, for this part of our panel discussion, I'm delighted to welcome Sergio Fajardo, who's from Colombia and is a mathematician and politician, and Cathy O'Neill from the States, who is a mathematician and data scientist and author of the book, uh, Weapons of Math Destruction. So thank you both. It's wonderful to have you here. And um, maybe you'd like to give us a fuller introduction to yourselves in the context of the international um, ICM. So, Sergio, go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm glad, very glad to be here with you, with the mathematical community worldwide. And I'll give you a quick introduction to myself. First of all, I am a mathematician. I got my PhD in mathematical logic at the University of Wisconsin Madison in the area of mathematical logic. And within mathematical logic, my area had been model theory and actually applied to probability in the intersection of logic, probability, and non-standard analysis with, and I had as an advisor and later as a co-author, a, a guy that I, I admire deeply, Professor Jerry Kiesler. And for a few years, I was a standard mathematician in the sense that I came back to my country. I spent a year after I finished my PhD in Madison in Boulder, Colorado, at the University of Colorado, but then came back to Colombia and I became a pro full professor here as a scientist, doing my research connected with my colleagues worldwide and working on, as I said, I would say the model theory of probability logics, a very beautiful subject. But after a few years, I made a decision in my life. 22 years and a half ago. And the decision was to take part in politics. I'd never been involved in politics in the traditional political parties. I've been always paying attention to my country. And the decision was, if we want to make changes in society, we spend the rest of our lives writing with opinions. I used to write papers in the newspapers. I was a member of the Colombian National Science Foundation, looking and trying to promote education and science as part of the change that we need in our country. But then I realized we need political power. Otherwise, we are going to spend many time, many years, and nothing is going to really happen. Well, I don't, I don't want to talk too much. After that, I 
got involved in politics, civic alternative politician. We created a civic movement in my city, Medellin, in Colombia. We made it, and uh, I became the first mayor in Colombia in Medellin alternative. Then I was the governor of the state, Antioquia, my, my state, the first alternative politician that came into power. And then I've been participating in the national presidential election, getting close, but not yet there. And well, I stopped there. Thank you. It's really, it's an interesting that you both have this feature. So Kathy, I'll, I'll ask you to introduce yourself in a moment, but I read on your blog, um, this interesting sentence, what can a non-academic non mathematician do to help the world? And that sounds like Sergio is coming from the, a very similar um, motivation. But go ahead, Cathy. Yeah, sure. Um, well, let's see. Um, I was really into Sergio's story, so now I have to think about my own. Um, I was a uh, undergrad at UC Berkeley and fell in love with number theory, uh, ironically, while I was visiting Budapest doing combinatorics. Um, and I also met um, my future uh, thesis advisor, Barry Mazur, who was visiting Berkeley. So then I was lucky enough to get into Harvard and I studied with Barry with um, a trip to Princeton for a year um, in between. And then I got it, uh, I got my postdoc at MIT and I had two children there, which was a lot, um, but still managed to get a tenure track position at Barnard. It was a two body problem. And if I'm honest, I was made to feel like I should be grateful for that uh, opportunity. And I was given a lot of committee work by my uh, chairman, John Morgan. Um, and at some point I was, I just thought to myself, huh, I think as much as I love number theory, which I really do, it's very beautiful. And especially the work I was doing with module um, was very, very beautiful stuff. Um, and became, <laughs> became very, important too um i really felt like my my skills were being somewhat exploited in the in the context of academic mathematics and that i was um capable of doing a lot more um so i left and i didn't know what i was doing at the, at the time this was 2006 got a job that i could get which was at a hedge fund right at the moment of the credit crisis i got to see it, it very close up uh, because i was working at a hedge fund called de shaw which was partly owned by lehman brothers so when lehman brothers fell um, that was a front row seat it really disillusioned me um, i left fin fin finance after a few more years uh we're trying to help out the risk side of things which i soon realized was also like a political cover mathematical cover, if, if you will. Um, so mathematics was being used as a, an excuse for corruption. And then I joined Occupy, but I needed a job. So I became a data scientist. And that's when I realized that kind of mathematical sophistication of a uh, cover was happening as well in the world of AI and data science. So that's how the book Weapons of Math Destruction came out. I also started a company when that book came out, um, which I now run. Uh, called Orca, which is an algorithmic auditing firm. And I'm happy to say that nowadays I am working with the insurance commissioners in Colorado and Washington, D.C., talking to federal and local agencies about how to audit algorithms or basically how to enforce laws in the age of AI. That's, it's so interesting. Um, we've both gone such, one could say that you're going in, um, very different directions and far away from math but um, but you're both i bet you're both seeing math in use all the time right more math than i but I, I i think so there's mm -hmm. plenty of math around in many yes. different ways yes i mean i i certainly use statistics and and mathematical reasoning and logic all the time i mean i'm because i develop frameworks for auditing algorithms but i think even more fundamentally and maybe sergio would find commonality with me here that the some of the training that i got in my early days in mathematics is very useful number one um ask really dumb questions like fundamental assumptions like i always go back to the fundamental assumptions and the hidden from view the blind spots you know the hidden from view assumptions um and that's important but the other important thing that goes along with that which i really th I, I think is due to my mathematical training is just to be grateful when someone points out my mistake, 
which is it's actually a very mathematical community thing and is not common in other fields at all. Usually people get very angry when their mistakes are pointed out. But if you if, if I'm making a fundamental thinking error or understanding error and someone tells it to me, like I just say, thank you for not letting me go on and waste more time thinking that wrongly. Let me add some things. First of all, I have to add, not only a mathematician, a scientist, but a professor. Being a professor and a way of dealing with students, and I always like to point out something that we all professors have, or should have, I think, in common is, we have to get the best out of our students. We have the ability to, we have been working with very brilliant people, extraordinary, very few walk in the streets like those, but we have to learn from those people, but from all those who have plenty of trouble building up some way of citizenship. Mm -hmm. So being a professor is crucial to me. Now, I just take something from Kathy saying, there is something that we do, which is, I don't know, let's see, let's work on, let's work on it. And that's very difficult for many people in politics because politicians are supposed to be, know everything. And they, you should have an answer for all questions that you face. And if you don't know, you have to lie, but you have to appear as having everything in your mind and saying, I don't know, let's see, maybe there may be different angles. That's something that is difficult for people in this world to handle. But, and now let me go back to logic. That's where I come from, which is, I, I always, people think of me, Kathy knows how to deal with algorithms. But I said, I studied logic because the beauty of reason. I never thought about logic being applied in anything in the world. And being a professor and studied that beauty of mathematics and in particular logic was always my pleasure. So people find it strange because they think, well, a mathematician, you have to be uh, adding up huge numbers. And, but being a logician and in model theory, which is that branch of logic, let me put it very simply, where you have different structures, mathematical structures, you use a language to compare those structures and to talk about those simultaneously and work on the language and then come up with results that can be applied in the different structures have been very useful for me because I was never trained in public policy or particular subjects, health and security and things like that. But being from this world, I can understand many things around. And that's very important for mathematics. The way we have been trained, we have the ability to come on into different worlds, learn, we learn quickly from as it has, it has happened to Kathy, we can move on and learn from different subjects. And that's very powerful. We have that capacity. And then I could see different subjects, study about them, of course, learn new things. And, but that gave me an open mind and a deep, an open look at different things, not just coming as an economist to understand the world as an economist in every branch, but with the open mind, learning the different problems, understanding the different problems that we have around and putting together teams and asking them the right questions. Always ask the question, why? That's the crucial question, why, why? I always tell people, I may not know, I may be willing to work with many people, but never tell me that I cannot ask why. I have, and you have to understand, you have to explain me. I'll do my best to understand, but why, always why? And putting together those different fields, assembling teams to solve problems, that's magic, that's extraordinary. That's an extraordinary part of politics. Politics have very terrible things around, but that part has been very, powerful for me had been very useful and it's math my mathematical mind my logician mind the ability to move in different walls to understand to get as deep as you want into different subjects put them together face the problem work on teams work on solutions and keep on and move step by step in order to get where we have to get that's fantastic so the the training and critical thinking um that being a mathematician does for us is um is 
is one of the things you're saying is is behind your how yeah. you bring your mathematical work to this different sphere of your life definitely um, being a professor yeah. never forget professor yeah i, I also want to echo uh sergio that that this kind of fearlessness that if there's a problem we can solve it um that you know what do, what do mathematicians working mathematicians are just constantly batting their head against the wall at the very edge of their field um actually the the real world problems are a lot easier to solve it, it they <laughs> <laughs> relative to math research you're just like oh this will take three days like we can figure this out this is relatively simple um but but it's still something that you know and you know Sergio says that politicians are supposed to know everything I think that's absolutely right I also live in a world where people are supposed to know um but what what's really going on is that they're afraid of not being able to solve the 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 problems once they uncover them and so the fearlessness of being able to solve problems, no matter what they are, is also something we're trained at as mathematicians, as well as sort of incremental progress. Right, that's a good point. But nevertheless, so, let's say that in politics, we are rare objects, very rare in many senses. Because I talk, let me give something that I like to mention and I'm not being rigorous, but just very intuitive. In mathematics, what we do, we have a set of axioms and we prove theorems and it's a step by step. You have first step, second step, until you get to the point where you got, finally, this is proved. Now, and in very low elementary logic terms, every step that you take in a proof, a mathematical proof in order to get to truth is either an action or you follow a deduction rule and you cannot contradict what you had previously uh, written down to be very simple take that to politics and i claim you have to be coherent and that's very difficult in politics one of the things that you see in politics you see a guy who one day say he says or she says something and the next day say they say the complete opposite and they have no trouble with that it always troubles me. Said I cannot believe what I'm seeing. This guy, I have seen him doing this and that. And in political terms, many times that they say politics are dynamic in the sense that people change. So that goes against mathematical proofs. So what I claim is being coherent and consistent. You don't build what you do in mathematics that you end up proving a theorem, truth but building trust that's the word that comes truth trust and being coherent consistent and that's very rare very very politics so i am characterized as being coherent consistent then you're called idealistic and very difficult to deal with because we point out contradictions we have as kathy said we have the perfect eye to see the problem in anything that you find you have in front we mathematicians are very good at that the best in the world there is a problem here so if if you can take that to politics you are going to find plenty of problems incoherences inconsistencies and well uh, just to synthesize that what i said truth for me in math is equivalent to trust in politics and basically there is a path to get which is analogous in order to get to truth and in order to be uh, truthful, trustful. It's a great analogy. And do you think within politics, so you're describing how our mathematical minds get are well suited to, um, to finding the errors and the consistencies or inconsistencies in what people say. Do you think within politics there are particular social challenges that as a mathematician you're, you're you're well suited to um, attack? I think many. Mm -hmm. You will be well suited to many problems. Now, my, my main concern for Colombia, Latin America, let's say, mm. is education. How we get into education and sciences and how we can understand the world, how we can provide equal quality education for every human being in Latin America, let's say. 
it should be worldwide, but let's talk about Latin America. So I am a Latino and build a society which is equal. We have plenty of inequalities in our societies. And my claim has always been, we have to do many things, but any path that we take in order to work on this unequal world, unjust world that we have, has to go through education. And if we don't have, and we have to understand education, we have to understand changes, many things, but that has to be part of our national project in order to transform our society, to fight against violence, unjustice, inequality, many things that we have to work on. And so education, sciences, we one of the points that we have today, well, yesterday we elected a Colombian president and it wasn't me, but uh, for example, looking for equality with regard to women in society, many things that we have to do and all of them have to go with education, sciences, innovation, technology, all these things can be elements in order to unite a country and to improve the quality of life in our country. Mm. Kathy, how about um, in, in the world where you worked, are there specific social challenges that you think it, you're especially well suited to address? Or that that world, that that sphere of work is well suited to address? Um, I think I want to go, I mean, I'll, I'll answer that question, but I just want to go back mm -hmm. to Sergio's response. Mm -hmm. To be clear, he is drawing on his mathematical and logical roots, but he has a lot more going for him as we see, see in this short conversation. Um, and I think for first and foremost, he's a communicator and uh, an empathetic and earnest voice, right? You can, you can tell just by the way he speaks that he cares and he's human and he's humane. Um, and I think those are the things that also I, I have and, and, and can use. So I actually, I think of myself first and foremost as a communicator, you know, at this point, um, I, I often communicate technical things. That's kind of the weapons of mouth destruction was was an act of communication um none of the stuff there was particularly sophisticated but it was you know understandable to people who are not mathematicians and so that was the hard part actually um, and that's what i do in my normal job what i'm trying to do is be a middleman between business folks or regulators or or lawmakers on the one hand and the data people who are not trained to be communicators so i'm a bridge I'm a, I'm a right. translator, if you will, of, of technical notions to non-technical people, but I also, on the way, I don't just, like SRGO does, I don't just translate it mathematically, I translate it into human uh, consequences. So I say, this is what this does, and this is what it will, this is what it, uh, its effect will be, its impact, this is human impact. Here are the potential harms on humans that this faulty algorithm will have. Um, and so, yeah, I think I think, you know, plenty of mathematicians have communication skills. Some of them don't, uh, just to be clear. <laughs> it's not it's not purely translatable. Um, and that is, of course, that along with organizational ability, you know, were the things that I was like, I, yeah, I could do a lot of things. Um, and I don't have to be doing academic math, although I do miss it sometimes. And I do love teaching. So let me add something in this setting that we're talking, which is a deep discussion within politics. Many people most in politics says the end justify the means we have to win and whatever it takes we have to do it and coming from mathematics from mathematical logic being a professor i always claim the means justify the end the path that we follow in order to get where we want to get will determine the quality of what we are going to do mm -hmm. and that's very that's a very difficult discussion in political terms and but I, I deeply believe in that because I think that every step that we take, we get closer to where we want to get. But in the path that we are following, we are changing society, doing politics, the way we talk, for example, in Colombia, we had a very aggressive, very dirty campaign. And I always was known as, as a um, uh, responsible guy, respectful, which is not very popular all these days, you respect, you don't, uh, don't offend people just because you have to be noticed, for example, in the social networks, all these things. 
But I deeply believe in that. And I claim the way we talk, we are the main educators in our society, politicians. And you know, we have to take this very seriously. And how in a country, well, I have seen, I, I like the United States very much. I live there and I have the opportunity. Actually, Kathy, I've been in Berkeley visiting first time as a mathematician many years ago and in the last years as a politician talking this in the Center for Latin American Studies is a beautiful city, talking to people there, talking about politics, leadership and so on. Uh, and I like the United States, but what is what has been happening there, I am very, mm -hmm. uh, let's, well, we are, pol I am a politician, so I can talk about politics. That's what I was invited here. But I, I see some things that are very disturbing. And what happens there has an effect worldwide. And that's something that we have to always claim, decency, respect, recognition, reasoning, things like that, that should be very basic in our relationships in society. Yeah. You know, Sergio, I just came up with another book and it's called The Shame Machine. It's about um, manufactured shame on social media and elsewhere um, that, yeah, I totally agree with you. That makes it almost impossible to have dignity in um, communications because the, the, our style of communications has been conditioned by essentially by, uh, you know, social media algorithms that privilege argument. Hmm. And, and, and you know all about that shame yes yeah that's i just wrote a new book about it um and i i end the book by by calling for dignity and and respecting communication so yeah i'm completely with you what's the mechanism for privileging argument um well the algorithm optimizes to engagement which is to say keeping you on facebook mm -hmm. let's say um, and so in some sense, we train that algorithm by clicking on the most, the car wrecks and the arguments and the conspiracy theories. But basically anything that keeps us engaged, which typically means either obsessed or angry or enraged or outraged. Um, so those terrible feelings um, are the things that are, um, are pri privileged by the, that served to people. So basically, if you are on Facebook, it's it's it knows it has a profile of you or any social media and it will say, what is the most outrageous thing that will fit your profile of, you know, your interest um, to keep you, you know, fighting with people for the next three hours? Because as long as you're here, you're going to click on ads and we're going to make money. It's completely uh, flattened the notion of, of debate or civil disagreement. Oh. Yes. I'm going to buy your book, Kathy. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so um, I'm wondering, for the sake of the, the junior mathematical scientists who are listening to this um, and who are inspired by you and might want to consider similar careers, do you have advice about how they might shepherd their own educational training? I do. Yes, go for it. Which is the following. As I said, have an open mind. We are used to work on very difficult problems, very narrow problems where we have to develop our skills, being smart, all these things, our intelligence. And of course, they are very minimal regarding the world, but you can do that. And at the same time, be conscious that you are part of this world. And so open your mind, listen to different aspects of life, and, and pay attention to those things and be conscious that you are a citizen and you are a part of this world and that we have responsibilities. You have as most of the persons who have entered the math world have, have a, a special talent and that talent can be very useful to many people if you have an open mind. Do your math, do your work, work very hard. I don't have to tell you that. We all do. If you are a mathematician, you have discipline, persistence, you, you have to uh, face all sorts of walls, but be conscious that there is a very wide wall in front of us. So open up your minds and use those talents to uh, make world, the world better. 
Oh, well, I agree with that. Um, I would just add that you should practice communicating. Um, when I inter when I used to interview people for data science jobs, I would ask them like explain like assume that I'm a business person. I don't know statistics. I want you to explain statistical significance to me or error bars. And people just couldn't do it. They just couldn't do it with like normal English. Um, so practice explaining technical notions in normal English. Um, even I think that would even be applicable to politics, but maybe Sergio would disagree. It's certainly I agree. No, 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 I agree. Yeah. It's certainly applicable to um, the world, the work I do, um, and and anybody who wants to be any kind of applied data scientist as well. Right, and those are both things that you have suggested are not common in a mathematics PhD environment. These are not things we train math or even mathematics undergraduates. So um, I wonder, maybe, do you have advice for mathematical institutions? about ways that we could um, and I'm by institutions I mean academia or professional scientists uh, societies or governments about ways to um, accelerate progress towards social questions through the mathematical sciences either in our train either in the Mary way Lou, if you had you could have started this entire conversation with us like asking us to critique uh, academic mathematical institutions yes well uh, the reason i left the conversation end is so that we didn't we only have two time. minutes okay <laughs> um here's a suggestion um yes do you know how musicians can be composers or they can be performers uh -huh. i think mathematicians should also be allowed to concentrate on on either like true research or performance of mathematics and performance can be a, like a way of really communicating with the public that we don't really have that we no, expect we, we expect mathematicians to narrowly do research um, and then not practice communication except maybe with their graduate students yeah. i think we could do a lot more in that direction and that would be towards the kind of thing that sergio is talking about as well i just have to say you're speaking to my heart because in england there is a medal called the zeman medal named after my father precisely for mathematical communication Oh wow! Yeah, so I am good for him. with you there. But Sergio, go ahead. I agree with Kathy. We just have to say, uh, I remember in mathematics, even within mathematics, when you try to explain very deep results in basic terms, even to mathematicians, in the culture, mathematical culture, that was disregarded as saying, "Oh, this guy is not as intelligent." We know that. Yeah. And communications are very important in all levels, even within mathematical sciences. And there are some brilliant people who have done it very well. And we have to persevere in that and and emphasize that. And people who are leading math departments, making sure that they understand this. And of course, bringing people from different parts of the <clears throat> this world, not in the geographical sense, in the world where we live in from different aspects of society and inviting mathematicians to be part of that conversation bringing them we all ha i have my coffee here we have coffee in our yellow pan to do things <laughs> and i have my path here and i always have my my book around and all these things but bring more people around bring them no problem and let our mathematicians uh, talk to other people and invite them and but do that permanently that may help yes so you're to, you're advocating for different ways for bringing mathematicians into the world and across the disciplines and and kathy's advocating for somehow within the mathematical community recognizing that that's a valuable thing for mathematicians to be doing yeah these incentives are all wrong so if you want to yes. we can reconvene in, in a couple of years and, and change the incentives of the academic institution to make that possible yes wouldn't that be a dream right well we're speaking to the international congress of Mathemat mathematicians right Good. let's maybe they'll hear this a little bit and think about the incentive structures in the i'm sure there are plenty of mathematicians who are very interested in the world you yes. have to show them Yes, I'm sure there are many. There are so many. All our students are. They care very much about the world and we gradually train out of them. 
they, we train into them that mathematics is your professional life and that other stuff is not. Yeah. And you are both fabulous examples of bringing together that mathematician plus your interest in the in being able to bring your side interest to be your professional life. Okay. Yeah. So thank you very much. Is that, are there any last comments you'd like to make before we um, say goodbye? Well, thank you for giving me an opportunity to meet Sergio. That's what I wanted to say. You need to meet Kathy. Thank you very much. It's to meet you, Mary Lou. I know that uh, I love mathematics. I'm very proud of being a mathematician. And I think we can contribute to make this world much better, much better. Well, thank you, everybody, for listening. And thank you to our panelists for such, making such interesting points. Um, if you have questions, uh, you can go to the discussion area in Discord. So I've just put in the chat the directions for how to get to Discord and where in Discord is the discussion part for our panel. And then I would just like to make the final point. It got made a few times during the panels, but I think it's really striking and somewhat troubling that everybody on the panel described how they had to step sideways from what Sally called the academic treadmill to do this work. And so maybe a take home message for all of us is that a fundamental responsibility for the mathematics community now to help accelerate progress on social challenges is to develop mechanisms for junior mathematicians to safely explore that interplay between mathematical sciences and pressing social 